my pleasure to have uh, Vinod Vakuntanathan here from uh, uh, the crypto group at IBM Watson. Before that, uh, he was a student of Shafi uh, Goldwasser at MIT, uh, where he won the sort of MIT Best Thesis Award for his work on crypto and distributed computing. Uh, and since then, he's been doing a really a lot of fantastic work, sort of spanning a number of topics in security and cryptography. And I guess he's going to tell us about a number of those things today. Thank you, James, and especially for pronouncing my name accurately. Um, <laughs> A, and thank you, thank you all for having me for uh, today's talk. Uh, the topic of today's talk is side channels and clouds, new challenges in cryptography. The, the development of cryptography has always gone hand in hand with the emergence of new computing technology. Whenever there is a big change in the way we do computation, it has posed new problems and challenges for cryptography and ultimately led to um, big advances, paradigm shifts really in the field. In fact, looking back in the history of cryptography, we can see a number of examples of this, starting right from basic pen and paper cryptography to the emergence of electromechanical computing devices, which led directly to complex ways of constructing codes and breaking codes. Perhaps the most famous example of this is the Enigma machine of the 1930s and 40s. And finally, the development of uh, small and cheap uh, electronic devices as a primary method of doing computation which led to the development of uh, public key cryptography, and so on and so forth. Today, in the 21st century, we stand at the brink of yet another new trend uh, in computing. First of all, a lot of the computation these days is being done in small and cheap, um, small and mobile um, electronic devices, which execute in environments that we do not necessarily trust. Whereas we used to think of our data being stored and the programs being computed in a personal computer, sitting in our office and completely under our control, these days we regularly use devices such as laptops, mobile phones, and we interact with sensor networks and RFID devices. And the problem is that these devices are just out there computing, where an attacker has an unprecedented amount of um, access and physical proximity to these devices and control over these devices. The second big change is that the amount of data that we need to store and the complexity of computations that we need to perform on this data has become so huge that the end users do not want to do all of it with themselves. Instead, what they do is they outsource storage and computation to big third-party vendors such as uh, Microsoft, Amazon, and Google, and IBM, of course. Um, and um, uh, this, trend is called, this trend commonly called cloud computing is again a big concern for us cryptographers simply because we are putting our data and programs out there away from our trusted personal computers. This new computing reality raises two big challenges for cryptography which will be the focus of this talk. First of all, in cryptography we traditionally think of cryptographic devices as black boxes. What this means is that the only way an attacker can gain access to these devices, the sensitive data that's stored within these devices and the computations, is by giving them input and receiving the output of the computation. What's going on within the device is completely unknown to the attacker. This is the sort of working assumption in most of cryptography. Fortunately, in the real world, it turns out that these devices leak a lot more information than that. In particular, an attacker can use what are called physical attacks or side channel attacks to gain more information about the sensitive data that's used within the devices and the, and the internal computation over and above what it can get using simple input output access. Side channel attacks are, are physical attacks. They use the fundamental principle that computation is a physical process. And all kinds of physical characteristics of computation, such as the time it takes to, to, to run a program, the, the, the characteristics of the power consumed uh, during a program execution, electromagnetic radiation, acoustics, temperature, and so on and so forth, all these physical characteristics leak information about the internal computations and can potentially be used to break the underlying cryptography. And this, is the, this is the problem that we face. These attacks are not completely new. In fact, we've known about these attacks for well over a decade, maybe a couple of decades. But the fact that the attacker has physical proximity to these devices makes these attacks much more severe, much more acute, and much more realistic. 
these attacks are not uh, uh, theoretical attacks. In fact, variants of these attacks have been used to break many well-known and standardized uh, uh, cryptographic algorithms, such as the RSA algorithm, uh, advanced encryption standard, and so on and so forth. So this is really a practical concern for us. So our first challenge for today is can we protect against information leakage that's caused by all these different kinds of side channel attacks? Okay, so that's the first challenge we'll focus on today. The second challenge arises in the context of security in cloud computing. Um, let's, uh, let, let me um, sort of recap what, uh, uh, what the general setting of cloud computing is. In this setting, there's a client and a server. Uh, the client has some input data and she wants some computation to be performed on this input data. Uh, unfortunately, she doesn't want to do the computations herself simply because she doesn't have enough resources to do the computation or for various other reasons. So what she does is she sends the data to the server, gets the server to do the computation and return the result back to her. Right? So this is a very sort of general and abstract setting and it includes as special cases a number of uh, sort of well-known and, uh, and familiar problems, such as the problem of doing a database search. But also this includes uh, sort of the general case of executing an arbitrary program on the input data. So in this setting, first of all, the client doesn't want to reveal her entire input to the server. Why would she do so? Uh, and the canonical way of achieving privacy of her input data is to encrypt the data. In other words, what she does is she takes her input encrypts it and sends the ciphertext or the encrypted data to the server. And now the server is in a little bit of a fix. It wants to do some meaningful computation on the input data, but it simply doesn't have access to the input data. All it sees is a ciphertext, is the encryption uh, of this data. So how is it supposed to do this computation? In other words, the question is, is it possible to achieve the opposing goals of privacy on the one hand and functionality on the other. Or more concretely, our second challenge will be, can we compute on encrypted data? Can we do meaningful computations on encrypted data? Right? So these are the two questions I will address in this talk. The talk will proceed in three parts. Uh, in the first part, I will show a mechanism to protect against side channel attacks. This is a very very, very active and very sort of energetic field of uh, uh, cryptography at this point. There have been a number of models that capture classes of side channel attacks and the design of uh, uh, various cryptographic primitives that are secure in these models. What I will talk about today is, um, is a particularly simple model that captures a class of side channel attacks and the design of a particular cryptographic primitive, namely public key encryption, that is secure in this model. So this is what I'll talk about today, this part. The second part, I will show a mechanism uh, to compute on encrypted data. This is done using a very powerful cryptographic tool called fully homomorphic encryption, and I will actually show uh, a fairly complete construction of a fully homomorphic uh, encryption scheme. And finally, I'll, I will tell you about a number of open problems that arise out of this work and a bunch of uh, future directions. Okay, so this is how the talk is going to go. Um, any, any questions? Uh, good time to stop and ask. Good? Great. Wonderful. So part one, let's jump right in. How to protect against side channels. So the first thing we want to do is to come up with a clean and simple model that captures a class of side channel attacks. The difficulty, the, the challenge in doing so is that there are a whole bunch of different kinds of these attacks. And each different kind of attack leaks a different type of information. And that makes it very hard to model uh, a meaningful class of uh, side channel attacks. For example, uh, what's called the cold boot attack, which was uh, sort of developed and popularized recently. Uh, in this attack, what an attacker learns and uses is a subset of the bits of the internal state of the device. So let's say the internal state of the device is a bunch of bits. This includes the contents of the memory, the contents of the registers, and so on and so forth. And during this attack, what the attacker gets is some subset of, uh, of these bits, let's say 50% of these bits. In a, in a timing attack, on the other hand, the attacker gets, what the attacker gets 
is the Hamming weight of the state of the device. In other words, the number of bits that are set to one in the state. And in something like a power attack, the leakage is a more complicated, low degree polynomial function of the internal state. So these attacks comes in, come in all kinds of shapes and forms, and that makes it hard to come up with the one model that captures um, these attacks. So one way to approach this variety of uh, different kinds of attacks is to, um, is to deal with these attacks as they come. Uh, in other words, the approach is to uh, design tailor-made solutions, one for each different kind of attack. The problem with this approach, there are a bunch of problems with this approach. The first problem is that, um, is the problem of cost. Uh, in particular, uh, the cost of uh, building in protection obviously grows with the number of side channels that you want to protect against. And that's simply because you deal with each of these attacks separately. The second and the, probably the more serious and subtle problem is that sometimes when you implement two solutions, one that is designed to work against each type of attack, the composition of the two solutions, namely when you put these two solutions together, one on top of the other in the same system, it, is, it turns out to be completely insecure against either kind of attack. In other words, there is no guarantee that the different solutions will work well uh, with each other. And this is really a serious problem. People have written sort of papers about it, and you know, we are, we're concerned about this kind of a question. And finally, there's the issue of new and unanticipated attacks that are around the corner. There's no way to protect against them using sort of the, the specific approach. So what we want to do is we want to come up with a clean and simple mathematical model that captures a class of side channel attacks. Yes, let me stop here. Um, so can you sketch what your attack model is for, for what you're trying to prevent, or is that about to come up? That's the next one. Okay. Thank you for the question. Uh, so uh, what we want to do first is to come up with a clean and simple mathematical model that captures a class of side channel attacks. Uh, so how do we set this thing up mathematically? Well, uh, in our setup, there are uh, two entities. One is the device, which stores the secret key, um, uh, comes up with a bunch of random bits, do some internal computations, takes an input and produces an output, and so on and so forth. The second entity is a side channel attacker. And what the side channel attacker does is it comes up with a leakage function that is chosen from some class of functions. And this is supposed to capture the fact that the attacker can choose which attack to mount on a, on a particular system adaptively, depending on what's, uh, what's going on outside. Right, so this is, uh, once it comes up with this leakage function, it gets the result of the leakage function applied to the internal state of the device. Right, so that, that's, that's, the, that's the sort of the general abstract model that we're going to work with. And this sort of framework raises a bunch of interesting questions that we need to address to come up with a sort of concrete workable model. The first question is, what is the leakage function supposed to see? In other words, what is the input to the leakage function? Can it see the entire internal state of the device? Or maybe some of the bits of the internal state are protected and the leakage function cannot see it. So the question is, what is, uh, what is the input to the leakage function? That's the first question. And secondly, the attacker chooses the leakage function from some class of functions. And the question is, what is this class of functions? Obviously, it seems better to uh, tolerate as large a class of functions as possible, but you know, one needs to pin this down to come up with a concrete model. We answer the first question, namely the question of what the leakage function can see, by being conservative and by letting the leakage function depend on the entire internal state of the device. And that includes the secret key, includes the random bits, all the, sort of the bits of the internal computation, and so on and so forth. Just for the purposes of uh, and, and what it gets is the leakage function applied to, uh, to this entire internal state. Just for the purposes of this talk, just for simplicity, I will talk about the leakage function applied to the secret key of the system, rather than the entire internal state, just the secret key. And I do this just for the purposes of simplicity. All our results can actually uh, be, uh, all our results actually carry over to the more general setting as well. Okay, so, so we, uh, answer the first question conservatively by letting the leakage function depend on the entire, so whatever is going on within the device. The concrete model that we, that we propose is called the bounded leakage model. 
And the starting point of this model is the observation that if you let the leakage be an unbounded number of bits, in other words, if you let the output length of the leakage function be more than the length of the secret key, then you cannot achieve any level of security. And that's simply because given, the, given this power, the, uh, the leakage could simply be the secret key itself. And given this leakage, there's nothing that you can do. So it seems that uh, an obvious restriction that whether one can place on the leakage function is to bound the output length of the leakage function, is to bound the amount of leakage that the adversary can get. And in particular, we want this number to be less than the length of the secret key. This seems like an obvious restriction. In fact, we will talk about a parameterized version of this definition where the number of bits of leakage that the adversary gets is a beta fraction of the bits of the secret key. The beta is a number between 0 and 1. And obviously, what we want to do is to, is to get as large uh, a leakage fraction beta as possible. Okay, so this is the bounded leakage model. Um, it's a very simple model, and, uh, and this is the model we'll work with for the, for the rest of this talk. There are a number of ways in which you can generalize this model. So uh, once you come up with this model, the, the, the question to ask is, what are the class of leakage functions? What are the class of side channel attacks that this model captures? It turns out that this model captures some set of side channel attacks. In particular, it captures the cold boot attack, but not you know, a whole bunch of other attacks. Um, this model can actually be generalized in a number of different ways to capture all these other classes of attacks. Let me tell you about one such generalization called the continual leakage model. The question we ask in, the, in coming up with the continual leakage model is, you know, despite what I said before, despite uh, the, you know, my argument that the total amount of leakage has to be bounded, can, is there any way in which I can tolerate an unbounded number of bits of leakage? Is there any way to kind of tweak the model and, and let, this, uh, uh, let the leakage be unbounded? So obviously, you cannot do this if you keep the secret key the same, simply because I can leak the first bit of the secret key the first day, the second bit the second day, and very soon I will get the entire secret key. In other words, the only way to work against an unbounded number of bits of leakage is to continually refresh the secret key, is to continually be on the run, and every once in a while, I'll randomize the secret key so that the total, so that the, the information that the adversary gets on the second day after I've refreshed the secret key is kind of independent of the leakage that he gets on the first day. And uh, I can achieve this while only assuming that the total leakage per unit time, uh, let's say per execution or per day, is bounded but the total number of bits of leakage overall can be unbounded. I will have an opportunity to talk a little bit about how I achieve this result towards the very end, but for the rest of this talk, we will focus on the simpler bounded leakage model. Yes? So when you refresh the secret key, obviously it shouldn't involve having to re-encrypt all of the data you've already encrypted beforehand. <coughs> yes, so, uh, the, excellent question. Um, in other words, what you're saying is that um, if you're using a public key system, uh, you should be able to refresh the secret key without changing the public key. So, you know, the, I encrypt my data using the public key, and that should remain the same, right? So that is, in fact, the challenge uh, in getting this to work, and, you know, I'll talk about this a little bit at the end. Okay, so rest of this talk, let's focus on this simple, simple model. Um, and again, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll focus on the specific case of public encryption to illustrate both the model and the, and the design of the solution. Now let's uh, remind ourselves of what the setting of public encryption is. There are two parties. There's an Alice, well, <laughs> there's a Bob and an Alice. And Bob wants to send a message privately to Alice via a public channel. The way this works in the public key setting is that Alice comes up with a pair of keys, a public key and a secret key. She publishes the public key up in the sky so everyone can see it, and she keeps a private key to herself. When Bob wants to send a message to Alice, he encodes the message into a ciphertext and sends it over the public channel. Uh, and when Alice gets the, the, the ciphertext, she can decrypt it and find out the message using her secret key. The, the model of security, the, the definition of security here, is that an attacker who stands in between Alice and Bob, who can look at the, so the, all the messages that are going on between them, wouldn't be able to 
to guess which message was encrypted. So he sees the public key, which is up in the sky. He sees the ciphertext going through the public channel. And he has absolutely no clue what the message is. Right? This is the, so the standard security definition. And one thing I want you to observe about the security definition is that the attacker has absolutely no information about what goes on within Alice's computer, what goes on within the decryption box. Right? The way we enhance this standard definition of security to, to take care of leakage as well is, is by doing a simple modification. We let the attacker get the public key and the ciphertext, and we also let him come up with a leakage function. Right? So this is something that he comes up out of, this is something of his choice. And as a result, he gets the leakage function applied to the secret key of the system. And following our discussion before, we, uh, the only restriction that we place on the leakage function is that it has bounded output length. And it can be arbitrary, conditioned on having bounded output length. Right, so this is, uh, this is our definition of security of public encryption schemes in the leakage model, the bounded leakage model. So now that we have sort of a concrete cryptographic primitive and a concrete model to work with, the question is, the first question that, that we ask is, how do the well-known encryption schemes, you know, the schemes that we know and love, I mean, how do these encryption schemes you know, work against uh, this model? Are they secure or not? All right, so that's the first question we ask. And unfortunately, it turns out that many variants of the RSA encryption scheme are actually insecure against bounded leakage attacks. In fact, there are various attacks against the, uh, against the RSA encryption scheme, uh, which, which completely break the system, given a small fraction of the bits of the secret key. And I think the best uh, attack so far um, uh, uh, breaks the RSA system, given a, a random quarter fraction of the bits of the secret key. Okay, so RSA is not going to work for us. Let's, uh, let's forget about it for leakage. Um, as for the uh, Diffie-Hellman-based Elgmal encryption scheme, we don't know of any explicit attacks against this encryption scheme, but we don't have any guarantee that the scheme is secure against leakage as well. So we don't know either way. Uh, in contrast, what we want to do is to come up with a scheme with the guarantee that it is secure against bounded leakage. That's what we want to do. The question is, are there other schemes out there which are actually secure against leakage? Yes. Point of comparison, yes. the, the, uh, the power leakage scheme, for example. Mm -hmm. What fraction would that end up being? That's a, that's a good question. In fact, um, a, so there are two questions here. One is, um, during a power attack, I get a bunch of data from the device. So this is like all kinds of uh, profile of power consumption during all the executions. And the second question is, uh, and the second thing is, uh, the way I use this data to come up with an attack. So uh, it turns out that for timing attacks and power attacks, the, the, um, the amount of information that I actually use to come up with an attack is about log n bits, or, or something uh, very small as a function of the length of the secret key. In other words, what I do is I run, the pr I run the device on an input, I get about log n bits of leakage that I will use, then I run the device again, so I get log n bits, log n bits, and then at the end I do some analysis and I get the secret key. So translating that to the continual leakage model, what this means is that if you can restrict the amount of leakage per execution or per unit time, you know, that's exactly the model that, uh, that we're talking about. Does that make sense? I still, still feel like I don't have a, you know, a good sense of how 0.26 compares to that. How 0.26 compares to that? So, uh, well, um, so what we have a handle on is how much information about the power attacks about that, that I can get from the power attacks actually ends up being useful in attacking the system. But there are there might actually be more information out there which I'm not using it's because of the particular way I'm conducting the attack, and that's actually an open question, actually. So I'll talk about this a little bit at the, at the very end of the talk, but figuring out what this number is, is really open. Yes, out there. Question. So this is just to 
uh, out of practical curiosity, like if I have a laptop here and someone wants to mount a power attack on my laptop, do they basically have to steal my laptop to then mount it to all their equipment to measure the power consumption doing some specific operations, right? Yes, yes. In which case it's kind of too late for me to change my secret key. Well, so, um, okay, good. So, so if that's the scenario you're, uh, you're looking at, we actually want to have code in the computer which refreshes the secret key every once in a while. And that code has to be kind of untamperable. I mean, this is public code, right? I mean, everyone can see this. Everyone can see the randomness that you use to refresh. That's fair game. What the attacker cannot do is he cannot modify. He cannot uh, do the following. He cannot erase the code that I used to refresh and force the system to run with the same secret key. As long as this is the case, um, you know, uh, it fits within the continual leakage model. So we need to have a mechanism to refresh the secret key. That's the main sort of uh, thing. Any other questions? Good. Sounds good. So good. So the question is, are there schemes out there that we can actually prove, uh, can actually guarantee uh, are secure in the bounded leakage model? And that's, in fact, exactly what we show. Uh, we show that uh, we show public encryption schemes that tolerate any constant fraction of leakage. So um, if the leakage is 99% of the secret key, that's fair game. 99.99%, that's fine too. In any constant fraction of the secret key uh, works, uh, works well with our scheme. And the scheme is based on uh, a new kind of mathematical object called lattices. And this is not sort of factoring or number theory based uh, crypto systems that we are familiar with, but it's a sort of more sophisticated um, sort of mathematical object uh, that we base these schemes on. Subsequent to the, to the first construction, we use the same ideas, we use uh, sort of modifications of the same ideas to show an encryption scheme based on more standard uh, Diffie Hellman uh, type assumptions, which have the same guarantees. They, it tolerates 99% of leakage. And what's the family of functions, leakage functions? Good. So uh, what's the family of leakage functions that these schemes protect against? Uh, the class of all sort of polynomial time functions, polynomial time computable functions, whose output length is 99% of the length of the secret key. Right? So that's the, that's the leakage class. Okay, so this is what we show. Uh, finally, you know, you win some, you lose some, right? I mean, uh, it turns out that the larger the leakage, the amount of leakage that you want to tolerate, the larger the parameters of your system get. So if you want to tolerate 50% uh, leakage, then your parameters become bigger by a factor of two, and, and, and so on and so forth. So the rest of this talk, I am not going to go into details about any of these specific schemes. And the question I will ask is, is there an underlying property? Is there an underlying principle that makes these schemes leakage resilient? Is there a way to explain the leakage resilience of these schemes in a, in a, in a sort of a unified framework? Question? Yes. Can you say something just briefly about what the lattices are that the, these schemes are based on? Yes, so, um, uh, so lattices are sort of uh, geometric uh, objects. They look like uh, sort of periodic grids, right? And I want to look at lattices in not just two dimensions, but n dimensions. And there are various uh, sort of problems that you would think are obvious in two dimensions become harder and harder as the number of dimensions grows. And you can base sort of encryption schemes based on these, uh, 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 these objects. And that's, that's essentially... Yeah. So cursor dimensionality type things? Come yeah. Cursor dimensionality? So uh, the, the specific problem that I'm going to, uh, that I base the security of the scheme is to find a short vector in these lattices. So I give you some representation of these lattices, find me uh, a very short vector. That's, uh, I'm not sure if that answers the question. Yeah? Questions? Good, so what I will show in the rest of the talk is two uh, new ideas, or two new properties, such that if an encryption scheme satisfies these properties, it is automatically guaranteed to be leakage resilient. Right, so um, the, the, the first property is that given a public key for this encryption scheme, there are many possible secret keys, right? In fact, I will require that 
given one public key, there are an exponentially large number of secret keys associated to this public key. If you're used to thinking about sort of uh, standard encryption schemes such as the RSA encryption scheme, RSA doesn't satisfy this property simply because in RSA the public key is a product of two primes and the secret key is a unique factorization of the two primes. So for one public key, there's one secret key, right? So RSA is not an example of the kind of encryption schemes that I want to talk about, but it turns out that there are many encryption schemes that have this property. So that's the first property uh, we want. Now, of course, an encryption algorithm uh, which takes a message in a public key and produces a ciphertext has no clue which secret key the decryption box contains. There are exponentially many uh, possible secret keys and the decryption box contains one of these secret keys. And the encryption algorithm, it just depends on the public key. It has no clue which secret key is contained within the decryption box. Another way of saying this is that no matter which secret key is contained within the decryption box, a ciphertext is decrypted to the same message. And this is something that you, that you obviously require for correctness. The, the, the encryption algorithm shouldn't depend on which secret key is contained within the device. All right, so this is the first property that we need. The second property we need from the encryption scheme is that the encryption algorithm comes in two different flavors. Uh, there is the real encryption algorithm, which um, Bob uses to encrypt his message. This is an encryption algorithm that takes a message, public key, and produces a ciphertext. And then there is this funny uh, fake encryption algorithm, which doesn't depend on the public key or the message. It just outputs a random string. It outputs samples from some distribution and outputs uh, the string. That's all it does. Now, the question is, why would you ever on Earth want to use this kind of an encryption algorithm? Because it seems to be completely useless. And in fact, it is. But what it's useful for is to argue the security of, is sort of in a mental experiment where you want to argue the security of the real encryption algorithm. And that's exactly what we'll use it for. The fake encryption algorithm or the fake ciphertext produced by the fake encryption algorithm behaves completely differently from the real ciphertext in the sense that if you encrypt, if you decrypt the fake ciphertext using all different possible secret keys, you will get different messages. So if you, if you decrypt it using the, the secret key right there on top, you will get one message. Um, another secret key, a different message, and so on and so forth. Essentially, for, if, you, if you decrypt the fake ciphertext using a random secret key, you will get a random message as the output. So that's, so essentially what that says is that functionally, a fake ciphertext is completely different from a real ciphertext. And regardless, and regardless, we will require that if I give you a real ciphertext on the one hand and fake ciphertext on the other hand, you won't be able to tell which is which. So they behave fun functionally completely differently with respect to the decryption algorithm, but still you can't tell which one you're given. And this is sort of the crypto magic that, uh, that happens in the construction. And what I will show very quickly is that if you have an encryption scheme with these two properties, then you automatically, then that is by design a leakage resilient encryption scheme. Okay, so how does that work? Well, you know, um, let's be realistic and let's look at the fake world first. Um, in, a, in, a, in the fake world, um, uh, given a fake ciphertext, the attacker has absolutely no clue what is the output of the decryption algorithm. And that's simply because it has no clue which secret key is contained within the decryption box, and each secret key decrypts to a different message. So it has no clue what's going on. Now, in, in our uh, security model, the attacker gets not just the ciphertext and the public key, it also gets some leakage from the secret key. So let's start slow. Let's say the leakage is just one bit, right? I mean, I get one bit of information about the secret key. So before getting this one bit, the attacker had a certain view of the secret. So there were an exponentially large number of secret keys that was possible. Now if I get one bit of information about the secret key, it reduces the space by a factor of a half. Right? I mean, one bit can give you, you know, uh, reduces the space by a factor of half. 
If you have two bits of leakage, it reduces by a factor of quarter. And finally, if you have, if the number of bits of leakage is bounded by something that is relatively small compared to the length of the secret key, you still have a large number of secret keys left that are possible secret keys within the decryption box. And again, each of these secret keys decrypt to a, to a random different message, and again, the attacker has absolutely no clue what the output of the decryption box is. Right? So, so in the fake world, the scheme is completely secure against leakage. The question is, what does this say about the real world? I mean, we are not interested in fake encryptions and the fake world. We are interested in the real world. That is completely, that is, that is very easy to, to deduce. That's simply because a fake ciphertext is indistinguishable from a real ciphertext. So in other words, another way of saying this is that uh, if the attacker has no information about what comes out of the decryption box uh, with a fake ciphertext, obviously he has no information about the output of the decryption box given the real ciphertext as well. And that's simply because they are indistinguishable from his point of view. Right? And that's actually the entire proof of uh, security of this, uh, of this encryption scheme. So what I showed is that if you, if you can come up with encryption schemes which satisfy two simple properties, you know, you're guaranteed leakage resilience or security against leakage automatically. Yes? But isn't this just saying that, well, if I have bounded leakage, then I just need a bigger encryption key so that even after the adversary gets whatever they will, I have a key of the appropriate length? Bigger secret key? Yeah. So, uh, not really. So, um, if, you, if you take RSA, for example, and you work with larger and larger uh, prime numbers, it doesn't matter what the length of the prime numbers is, you can still break the scheme given a quarter fraction of leakage. So, uh, increasing the length of the secret key doesn't do much for the security of RSA. Does that? Yeah, but that's RSA in particular. Right. So, the question is, can you... So, um, um, so increasing the length of the secret key doesn't automatically protect against leakage. So the question is, is there a way to come up with an encryption scheme with these additional properties which, uh, which actually help? Right, so the question is, if you have yes. a, 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 an encryption scheme where it's sufficient to increase the length, right? Then right. If, you have a, if, if you have an encryption scheme where increasing the length uh, is, is all you need, then you're done. Um, but you need to come up with sort of a, you need to come up with a way to argue that increasing the length is all you need. Right. And that's what I was just saying. The way is that yeah, trivial so is just saying, well, you know, with, with a beta fraction, if I multiply by one of the beta, then I have what I need. We, we should probably take this off. Yeah, we should uh, so let me sort of answer this very quickly, actually. So uh, you might be able to kind of uh, increase your secret key by a factor of one over beta, but then you're also giving more room to the attacker, right? I mean, he can kind of look at the whole secret key and compute some uh, sort of collective global function of it. We can take it offline. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes. So you have showed us that the attacker won't be able to figure out which one of the possible secret keys it, it, it is. Mm -hmm. But this is not his goal. His goal is to decipher, to decipher the ciphertext. Yes. Uh, he doesn't care which secret key it is because it's the other equivalent. Absolutely. So how can, can you actually prove that the attacker cannot get any information about the ciphertext? Yes. So that's in fact exactly what I can prove. So the argument goes as follows. In the fake world, right, the attacker can't figure out which of the, so the exponentially large set of secret keys is contained within the decryption box. And each of these possible secret keys outputs a different message on input the fake ciphertext. So obviously it can't tell which of them, obviously it can't tell what the output of the decryption box is going to be. And the same is the case in the real world simply because of an indistinguishability argument. So that's exactly what I, what I showed. Okay, so questions? No? Okay, good. Um, and something that I'm not gonna talk about today is that you can, you can actually, uh, a, a whole bunch of uh, encryption schemes that, that, that people have designed uh, have these uh, sort of magical properties, and you can, in fact, show that automatically show that all these schemes are leakage resilient. So let me finish this uh, this part of the talk by telling you a little bit about how you can extend these ideas to get leakage uh, uh, resilience against continual leakage. So again, uh, 
uh, let me remind you, the setting is that we want to tolerate an unbounded number of bits of leakage, except that you assume that um, in each execution or each time period, the number of bits of leakage is bound. So that's what we want to do. And the solution idea is to randomize or refresh the secret key in each, uh, between, each between any two time periods. The challenge in doing so, the, so the non-triviality in doing so, exactly as James pointed out towards the beginning of the talk, is that I want to do this while keeping the public key exactly the same. That's simply because I don't want to kind of re-encrypt all the data that I had encrypted under the old public key. And I don't want to kind of set up the pub, a new public key and incur the, sort of the additional cost. So I want to keep the public key the same while randomizing the secret key. And in fact, the machinery that we have designed uh, so far actually gives you a, a, mechanism, uh, a mechanism to do so. So let's say that um, the, uh, the decryption box contains one of these uh, secret keys and the attacker gets some leakage. The key is to um, be able to, the key technique is that you have an exponentially large number of secret keys. So you can potentially take one secret key and compute a random other secret key. And if you can do so, we can make sure that the, that the leakage from the different secret keys from different time periods are uncorrelated. And if, the, and, and, and if each of these leakage, uh, if each of these uh, uh, leakages is uh, sort of a bounded number of bits and all of them are uncorrelated, we can, uh, we can actually prove security for this sort of extended system. Okay, so that's, uh, so that's the, so we can, essentially the idea is that we can use the techniques that we developed to prove bounded leakage to sort of transparently extend to this uh, sort of bigger leakage model as well. Yes, question? So the more keys you have, theoretically, the easier it becomes to randomly guess one. Uh, so, and if you have exponentially many of them, that's exponentially easier. Do you have a good argue or a good reason for how many there should be or good. how so, to protect against that sort of thing? Good question. So, um, so let's say the total number of secret keys is like uh, 2 to the 200. Let's say, I mean, that's a, that's a reasonable number. And uh, so that's exponential, right? And um, let's say the number of secret keys for a single public key is 2 to the 100, right? So if you randomly guess a key, you will be correct with probability 2 to the 100 divided by 2 to the 200, which is still pretty small, right? So you're never going to be able to guess, sort of randomly guess a secret key and be correct with, uh, with any kind of probability. Does that, does that answer your question? Good. So that's all I... Okay, good. So, uh, in fact, we can, we can actually make this sort of outline uh, work and we can design uh, public key encryption schemes that are secure against uh, continual leakage, uh, where the amount of leakage in every time period is, a, is, a, is an arbitrary constant fraction. Okay, so this is all I wanted to say about protecting against side channel attacks. Um, let me, let's move on to part two, how to compute on encrypted data. Yes. You said that all this generalizes to arbitrary state, but in arbitrary state, uh, the bits are strongly correlated. Strongly correlated. So a certain Absolutely. fraction of leakage might be enough to completely guess this. Thing. Absolutely. In fact, in fact, that is the um, that is the mechanism that people actually use to uh, to, to mount actual attacks. The, the the reason that this generalizes, roughly speaking, the reason that this generalizes to leakage from the entire state is that in the uh, specific encryption algorithms that we construct, uh, most of the storage is the secret key itself. And the, extra, the, the, the space that I need to do the extra computation in the decryption of messages is very small. So it's, a, it's sort of an insignificant fraction of the entire storage, and we can actually sort of prove that this extra knowledge doesn't help the attacker. But that has a huge cost. Uh, no, not really. So, so we, we are actually getting both efficiency and security in the, in the same you goal. Maybe, right, because then you're using a small, you know, if you, have, if you need one meg, now because of this you're gonna need, you know, a, a billion megs or whatever. So asymptotically, the, uh, at least asymptotically, if the secret key length is n, then the extra space that I need to do this computation is something like log n. So not really, it's not like a you know, 100 times n, for example. In that case, I'd actually be losing efficiency, pretty, a pretty large amount of efficiency. This is so tiny that I don't really lose anything. Yeah, I, I didn't follow that because okay. the state, right, yeah. is not random. And, you, and we're talking about general state, not the secret key. 
Not the secretary, yes. So the state is essentially, uh, you know, the, 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 all the bits that, all the intermediate bits of uh, a computation. What is the computation that we are talking about here? It's, a, it's the execution of a decryption algorithm on a message with the secret key, right? And to do this, I can actually do this entire computation in small space. I can do this sort of in line, if you will. And uh, at any point of time, if I look at this extra state, you know, I'm not gonna get any sort of significant amount of information to, to affect the leakage. Good, so uh, let's move on to the second part, how to compute on encrypted data. So again, let, let me remind you of the setting. Um, uh, we're talking about sort of a client-server setting where the client wants to compute a program P on the, on the input data X. Uh, and the way uh, uh, she does it is she sends the data over to the server, the server computes the program and sends the result back. And, and, the, ser and the client actually wants uh, privacy of her input data. So what she does is she sends the encryption of her input to the server. Now what we want is a mechanism for the server, like a magic box, that takes the encryption of the, of the input data and the program and computes the encryption of the result. So uh, we're used to thinking of, uh, sort of encryption as like a locked box, right? So you put the message in the box, lock it up, send it to the recipient. Only the recipient who has the key can unlock it. What, it's sort of an intermediate observer, he looks at the locked box, he has no idea what the message is. Right, so that's sort of the physical analogy that we, that we think of when we think of encryption. Here, in contrast, what we want is a box, it's again a locked box, which has like a glove compartment attached to it. So you can put the message in the box, lock it, send it to the server. The server can kind of put his hands within the locked box and do funny stuff to it, but still he doesn't get to see what the, what's inside the locked box. So this is the kind of magical uh, sort of uh, property that we want from the encryption scheme. So again, uh, we can, uh, there are a number of special cases of this sort of general setting. Uh, for example, doing an encrypted database search, can, you can think of it as a special case of the setting. Uh, so a number of these special cases can actually be solved by special purpose tools. But what I will focus on today is the problem of doing a general computation on encrypted data. And this can actually be done by a very powerful cryptographic tool called, uh, called fully homomorphic encryption. So before we get our hands dirty and, and, and explain what a fully homomorphic encryption scheme is, let's actually see how we can possibly compute an arbitrary program on an encrypted data. I mean, it seems like a, a hopelessly complicated goal. How, how are we gonna possibly achieve this goal? So I'm gonna think of a program as a Boolean circuit. I mean, this is sort of a specific model of computation. In fact, you can think of uh, pretty much any model of computation the results kind of carry over uh, to that setting. But let's think of uh, a Boolean circuit composed of addition gates or exclusive OR gates and AND gates or, or multiplication gates. So it takes an input, it computes these sort of simple operations and produces an output. So in fact, any computation, uh, uh, um, the Boolean circuits with exclusive OR and AND gates are complete, in the sense that you can write any computation as, uh, as such a circuit. And in our setting, what happens is that the Boolean circuit gets not the input bits, but the encryption of the input bits, the ciphertext bits um, corresponding to the input bits. So now, suppose that you have an encryption scheme, a special kind of encryption scheme, which allows the computation of addition function and multiplication function on encrypted input bits. So namely, um, given uh, the encryption of two bits A and B, you can compute the encryption of their sum and the encryption of their product. Suppose you have an encryption scheme which has this property. You can compute the entire Boolean circuit on the encrypted bits level by level. So the first level you compute the can, can the first level gates on the encrypted input, and so on and so forth, and you can get the encryption of the output. And in fact, an encryption scheme that satisfies both these properties, namely you can compute both addition and multiplication on the underlying bits, is called a fully homomorphic encryption scheme. And that's exactly what we will design in this talk. So what do we know about fully homomorphic encryption? Well, 
Um, the, this creature was first defined by the name of privacy homomorphism by Rivest, Adelman, and Dattosos back in 1978. And the interesting thing is that they just defined this primitive, but they didn't really know how to construct, come up with a concrete construction of this primitive. So what they said was, suppose I had this magical object, look at all the cool things I can do. So one thing, one concrete problem that they focused on is the problem of searching on encrypted data. So they said, let's assume that there is this object, I can search on encrypted data. But they didn't have a concrete uh, instantiation of this primitive. What we knew uh, so far are encryption schemes that, that satisfy a limited, that um, support a limited form of homomorphism. So the RSA encryption scheme is multiplicatively homomorphic. What that means is that you can take an encryption of two messages and compute the encryption of their product, but not their sum. There are encryption schemes that uh, are additively homomorphic, so you can compute the addition function, but not the multiplication function. And there are a class of encryption schemes where you can compute simple functions on the encrypted input. But what was, but, but the problem of doing an arbitrary computation on encrypted data was open uh, for 30 years, since the time it was proposed by Robest, Robest et al. The first big breakthrough in this, uh, in this field came with the result of uh, Gentry in 2009, last year, where he constructed the first sort of uh, fully homomorphic encryption scheme. So he came up with the first way to concretely um, realize this, uh, this magical primitive. His construction was based on uh, tools from algebraic number theory, uh, ideals, and, and very sophisticated new mathematical techniques which were never used in cryptography before. So th it was really sort of a tour de force which introduced new techniques um, in cryptography. The very possibility that you can do, uh, that you can achieve fully homomorphic encryption raises a number of interesting questions. Uh, the question that I will be interested in today is, can we come up with a construction of fully homomorphic encryption which uses nothing but simple integer addition and multiplication? So I want to come up with a construction which my sort of grade six cousin can understand. I mean, he knows nothing but you know, adding and multiplying numbers is there a construction that, that is understandable to, to him? So I would like to argue that simplicity is a virtue by itself. It's something that we should try to achieve regardless of everything else. But as having a simple construction makes it easier to understand the, the underlying ideas behind the construction. It makes it easier to implement the construction and possibly improve on the efficiency. And that's exactly what we show. We show a construction of a fully homomorphic encryption scheme, which uses just addition and multiplication over the integers, and it's based on what's called the approximate greatest common divisors problem. I'll explain this in a little bit. Uh, the construction proceeds in a number of steps. Um, uh, the heart of the construction is to come up with a secret key, somewhat homomorphic encryption scheme. And that's, that's what I'll focus on for the rest of, uh, for the rest of this part. So how does the encryption scheme work? Well, it's a secret key scheme. So to encrypt and decrypt, you use the same secret key. The secret key is going to be a large odd number p. That's the secret key. I'm going to show how to encrypt bits. You can, you can encrypt sort of larger messages using the scheme, but let's just start with bits. Uh, how do you encrypt a bit p? You pick a random large multiple of p. Let's say q times p, where q is much larger than p itself. You pick a random small even number, 2 times r. Come up with a small number r, and uh, 2 times r is a random small even number. And the ciphertext is simply the sum of all these numbers. It's a multiple of p, a small noise, perturbed by a small noise, and uh, so the bit b added to it. OK, good. So, so I didn't use anything more than addition and multiplication so far. How do you decrypt the ciphertext? You first remove the multiple of p. That you can do by taking number mod p. And now the observation is that what remains, namely 2 times r plus b, is a much smaller number than p. So uh, this number is so small that if I take this number mod p, it doesn't affect the number at all. Right? So what I get is 2 times r plus b. And this is a number which has a whole bunch of random bits, 
and the bit that, I, that I'm interested in, namely B, at the very end, as the least significant bit. And so I can, I can simply read off this least significant bit, and I'm done, that this is the entire decryption process. Right? So again, I used a little bit of modular arithmetic, but you know, not much more than that. Good, so how do you add and multiply encrypted bits? Well, the, the key is to observe that a ciphertext is close to a multiple of P. And if I add two numbers that are close to multiples of P, I get another number that is relatively close to a multiple of P. Multiplication has the same property. So concretely, if I take two ciphertexts, an encryption of B1 and an encryption of B2, adding the two gives me something whose least significant bit uh, least significant bit of, so that once I remove the multiple of P, the least significant bit is the exclusive or the sum of the two encrypted bits. So if you want to add two encrypted bits, you simply take the two ciphertexts and sum them up over integers. That's that. Multiplication, it's a little bit more complicated expression, but it's, it's essentially you get the same answer. You get a multiple of P plus a small, a relatively small noise, it's much bigger than before, but if I start off with a you know, sufficiently small noise, I still stay within my bounds. And the least significant bit is the product of the, of the two bits. So a problem with this game is that uh, the ciphertext, as well as the noise that's contained within the ciphertext, grows with each operation that I do. So what I really get here is a somewhat homomorphic encryption scheme in the sense that this encryption scheme supports you know, computation up to a certain number of steps, but not arbitrary computations. And in fact, there is a way to uh, take this encryption scheme and bootstrap it to a fully homomorphic encryption scheme. But since I'm running out of time, I, uh, I will leave this to sort of the one-on-one -on -one discussions. So I told you about two problems today. Uh, uh, one is the problem of protecting against side channel attacks, and the other one is the problem of computing on encrypted data. Both these fields are very nascent. So the fields are just starting off, and we are, we are only now starting to get an understanding of what the problems are like, even. In the context of computing on encrypted data, the, the overwhelming question is to come up with a mechanism to do this, which is practical and efficient. What we really want to do, an overwhelming question in this field, is to come up with a reasonably efficient way to do uh, the same thing. So. Uh, with this, uh, I'll end the talk. Thank you.